Okay, let me get started with praying. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to pay attention, to be awake, and to be able to benefit from this class. And as we continue to think about your law and how it exposes our sin and the value of us understanding that enemy within. Lord, help us to make a study of that now and that your son would be honored through this study. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're, at, we're doing two questions today because they go together in a way that um, helps us to think about uh, and to avoid two extremes, which I'll talk about a little bit more clearly in the application time. But question 83 asks, are all transgressions of the law equally heinous? And the answer is, some sins in themselves and by reason of several aggravations are more heinous in the sight of God than others. Several aggravations there is really just an old-fashioned way of saying in several different ways there are degrees of sin based on different relationships that the sin, ha or maybe in some cases, based on different relationships you have to God or different duties or to other people. And it's really just a common sense thing once you start getting into it, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about ways in which, well, why wouldn't people believe that? One reason off the top of my head is maybe you're a former Roman Catholic or you know Roman Catholics and you've heard of the distinction between mortal sin and venial sin. And you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, is, this saying, is this saying there's a distinction of that sort? And the first question you'd want to ask is, well, would that have to be the only way that there can be degrees of sin? And then there's this other common sense things you run into, that, uh, which we'll look at in Scripture. These are the verses they put on there. I'll bring in those, but then a bunch of others as well. And then you have the complete opposite extreme, which is, what doth every sin deserve? And the answer they give is, every sin deserveth God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. And immediately, when you look at those two together, and that's why I'm putting them together, is you look at that and say, well, how can both of those be true? If every sin deserves the, the wrath and the curse of God, both in this life and that which is to come, then how can some sins, out of those every be more heinous in the sight of God than others. And maybe your only question is, well, if the least sin gets you to hell, or the least sin levels the playing field and we all need the cross equally, what are we even talking about here? So maybe that's the extreme that you're on. Okay, well then, this class is for you. There's, there's wrong ways to try to get out of this. One is you can use the words vertical guilt or vertical sin versus horizontal to describe aspects of how the sins differ. I think those are legitimate words to use. I use them all the time to distinguish between sins in different ways. So it's a legitimate category, but it can't be the ultimate category that answers this question. Uh, here the main reason is why. Um, just notice, even about the many different ways that a sin is sinful, even the, the degrees question, question 83, even those ones, the ultimate focus of guilt is still before God. It's just like the two tables of the law. Sometimes you think, well, commandments one through four, that's vertical. That's between you and God. That's worship. Commandments five through six, that's man and man. Honor your father and mother, murder, adultery, uh, all that stuff. That's between man and man. Well, not so fast. That's true immediately. But even when you break the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth, you're still sinning primarily against God. Okay, so that's not the way out of this. We've got to do some more thinking to see how to reconcile these two. Well, let's, uh, well that being the case, um, here's our outline for today. Question 83, that's dealing with the diversity. In both of these, we're asking, what makes sin so sinful? What makes it so bad? What justifies the punishment that we see, the wrath and the curse of God? And then how do these go together? How can they both be true? Okay, so let's start at the diversity of the sinfulness of sin. In other words, what makes different sins as sinful as they are under the assumption that they are different degrees of guilt? And these concentric circles here represents 
different degrees of guilt. And all I've done is put four, and there's other categories, but these are the four main categories. I'll mention them again in the sermon today as well, about the, the Jewish leader's guilt in respect to Christ. Sometimes things can be sinful as they are because of these things. Now, all of them are sinful in relation to God, but that doesn't mean that there's not diversity in there. So let's just go through, first of all, the fact of there being different degrees of sin. It's just a biblical fact, and some of the texts that we'll read will pretty much use words like greater and lesser and so on and so forth to make that point. So again, it's true that all sin is guilty of an infinite crime and therefore deserves God's eternal just sentence. But a thing can be one thing in one way and several things in a different way. In fact, most things are if we just think about it. So let's look at some verses, several different ways of showing the degrees of sin. Matthew 5, 21 and 22, and then again in 27 and 28. Those are just two examples in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you've heard it said of old. And he, the two examples here are murder and adultery. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Then a couple of verses down, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. One of the things we saw when we, when we did the Sermon on the Mount is we saw that there's two things in play here. And what a lot of people hear is, okay, Jesus is saying there's no difference between the sin in the heart and the sin out at the hands. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying in, in the sense that we're going to look at in our second question, for question 84, they are both guilty and you're in danger. The whole point of him warning you is so that you can nip it in the bud, is so that you can deal with sin at the root level. Anger, so it doesn't flower out to physical murder. Lust, so it doesn't branch out to physical adultery. He's not saying that doesn't make any difference, whether it's still in the heart or out there or whatever else. That's one wrong way to take that. Another verse to look at is Paul's language of storing up wrath in Romans 2.4, storing up wrath. The idea there is he's already convicted the Gentiles in chapter 1 of Romans, now he's going to the Jews. You who accuse others, don't you commit these same sins. In other words, he's charging them with hypocrisy and saying that, that, God, that God's been kind to you. Uh, God's been gracious. Uh, and so he, he's charging them for that and saying that you are storing up wrath. The sense there is it's building. Consider also John 19, 11, where Jesus tells Pilate, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So there's one of those verses that actually uses the word greater or lesser, a greater sin. Well, how can there be a greater sin than another sin if no sin is greater than another? Matthew 11, 22 and 24, you, you see the, the woes, the curses that Jesus is pronouncing on Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin, and he says that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon, and then he adds to that a couple of verses later, and the land of Sodom. It will be more tolerable for them on the day of judgment than for you. Well, how can it be more tolerable for them on the day of judgment if all sins have an equal guilt? And by the way, the, you know, the point there, we'll, we'll start to see the rationale for it. Here's the first that I would mention. Degrees of evil increase when the one who sins does so with greater knowledge of the truth. So in that Matthew 11 passage which uh, there is one more verse that is, that is in there in, in, in Matthew 11, but part of what's going on there is what? Bethsaida and Chorazin and those Capernaum, those villages would be more guilty on the Day of Judgment than even Sodom. Why? Because they had Jesus in front of them. He uses this language about uh, the Queen of the South coming to Solomon or Jonah, the people of Nineveh repenting. And he says that they will rise up in the judgment against you because something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Solomon is here. What's he saying? They saw the shadow. They saw the type, the symbol. 
and they're guilty if they reject God's message. You're seeing the substance, the fulfillment. It's clearer. You have the truth itself, the one who is the truth, standing before you. You are double, triple, quadruply more guilty. So it is a greater sin to reject a clearer presentation of the truth. You saw the same thing in John 19, 11, that verse I read about, he, he has the greater sin. Why? Because they were Jewish and they were the Jewish authorities. Pilate, he's a Roman. He's, he's a newcomer to this. He, he's less, he didn't say Pilate's not guilty. He said Pilate is less guilty. The same thing is in play in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10, those warning passages. These are people that are in the house of God. They're more guilty than the pagans outside. Degrees of evil increase when the distance between the sinner and the standard. So think of that picture from last week of the target up here to infinity. The distance between the sinner and the standard of his obedience is greater, and his spite toward that, his despising of that standard. As that spite increases of something so great, as opposed to, say, if he's just despising a traffic ordinance, right? Um, if I speed five miles an hour over a traffic ordinance, I'm, I'm guilty, but I'm less guilty than if I'm a priest of God and offer strange fire, like the Nadab and Abihu did in Le Leviticus 10. They were extremely guilty because of the standard of holiness and how much they despised it. Or the sons of Eli in 1 Samuel 1. Again, priests of God that despised their job. Or the priests that the prophet Malachi was calling out and saying, they, the, the words are recorded in Malachi, them saying, what a weariness is. They, they snorted at it, it says. What a weariness this is. What a weariness what is. To be priests of God. To have to, you're so nitpicky. What? We're just offering strange fire. In fact, that's the way a lot of us react to the text. What's the big deal? We're guilty of it when we, when we have those thoughts. Answer, God is the big deal. <laughs> and being a priest of God and handling the holy things is a big deal. So your, your guilt goes up. But also consider the vision of the old temple that was given to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 8, 6, and again in verse 13 and 15, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? God's giving him a sort of a, a vision into the, the priests in his day. Do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will still see greater abominations. And he says it again in, in, in those other verses, verse 13 and 15, but you will see greater abominations than these. Well, again, how can there be greater abominations than other abominations? Degrees of evil also increase when the degree of harm caused to others increases, and especially relative to their innocence. So if you have uh, influence over others versus if you don't, the more influence you have, the greater your guilt. That's why James 3, 1 says, let not many of you, my brothers, become teachers, for you know that with teaching comes the, the stricter judgment. Why? Because you could do more damage to more people. And I put in parentheses, young. Because now, just put that on hyperjet. Not just I'm a teacher, I influence people, but if I influence younger people, especially the most innocent. So Jesus says in Matthew 18, 6, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin or to stumble... It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Greater guilt. Degrees of evil increase when the sin is committed in the face of more grace, and especially over time and manner of previous mercies. If God has given you more and more and more, so another, go to this way on the right on the timeline, the more ticks you have in the timeline and keep sinning, the greater your guilt. Psalm 78, 17, in verse 32, yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. And in verse 32, in spite of all of this, in other words, in spite of still having mercy, in spite of God preserving them and giving them patience, in spite of all of this, they still sinned, despite his wonders they did not believe. 1 John 5, 16 and 17 is one of the verses I believe that is mentioned in the by the Westminster Divine, so I'll read it. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall 
ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. Now, you, you know, I, this is a long time ago now, but the sermon we did on the unforgivable sin, and is that maybe in Matthew 12, is that possibly linked to that in First John 5? That's an interesting question. I gave you my view then, so you have to go back to that sermon, but I don't want to get caught up in that. The verse for our purposes is at least teaching that there are degrees of sin, okay? Let me, since I don't have it in my notes, let me answer the, the idea of mortal versus venial sin. The problem with that teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is not that there's not degrees of sin. There are degrees of sin. I think that's why that may be for some people why they, they're like, what? What are we teaching here? Now, that's not the problem with it. They have a lot of problems. One is the idea that any sin would not be mortal sins. It's our next question. What, what does the word mortal mean? <laughs> death. It's, it's death-worthy or death-bringing. Um, all sin leads to death. Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sins shall die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Genesis 2, 16, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And we'll, we'll see why that is in the next question. That's the problem with it. Not the idea that, um, you know, that there's not degrees of sin. Okay. Degrees of evil increase when the sins of even the reprobate are not punished as swiftly as justice would ordinarily demand. So we saw Israel or maybe another child of God who is given mercy over time and their sin would be greater. But that same concept applies to the reprobate as well. We see this in the prophet Amos in the repetition of that formula for three transgressions and for four. And, and he goes through all the different places, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammonites, Moab, and then eventually gets around to Judah and Israel as well. But it's a poetic expression. It speaks of totality, numbers added up are seven, that, that God has reached the fullness of the patience that he is going to have and then pour out his justice in his own time. But as you sin more, you incur more guilt. Think about why that is. In those last two reasons, whether it's a believer or an unbeliever, if I sin the same sin tomorrow that I sin today, same sin in every, in every aspect except for one, one difference, that the Son of God's mercy rises on me tomorrow when He would have been just to punish me overnight. And therefore, in light of that, I have to ask, is tomorrow's sin the same sin as the sin I sin today? In one very important respect, it's not. Because now, as I continue to sin that same sin, it's actually worse because I've added ingratitude, I've added presumption, I've spit on God's mercy and His kindness and His patience. So is it the same sin in every respect? No, it, it adds, it builds, it, it incurs more guilt. So in all of these respects... Not every sin is the same in terms of the level or the intensity of its guilt. And it's very, very important that we don't, um, and, and I'll show you why in the application time. But so that's one extreme. You might be so like, for whatever reason, maybe because you've just left Rome or you have that idea of mortal sin of evil sin in your mind, maybe because you're, you're tired of cultural Christianity and you see people comparing themselves to others or just you're trying to preach the gospel and you can't get it in the heads of people when they say, well, I'm better than the next guy. Well, I don't do that. And they start comparing and you want to be gospel centered in one of these ways. And so you can't hear the Bible saying that, no, there's a difference between sins. And it's actually very important. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount would be just reason enough. Uh, I just ask people that all the time. Is Jesus really telling you about adultery, for example? Is he really telling you that, uh, no, it's no big deal. You might as well just go through with the whole relationship because all sins are the same. Is that really why he's telling you this? I don't think so. Um, so the same thing with murder and everything else. And we'll come back to that. But here's the second point, the unity in the sinfulness of sin. So we've seen that um, all sins are not exactly alike in every respect. Now, we're going to come to what looks like I'm saying the exact opposite, that we, that we speak of a, a level playing field. And, and this, what this levels is our pride. What this levels is our arrogance. 
Here's where the person who says, you know, there's no difference between me and Hitler. I always want to tell that person, I'm totally with you there if you finish the sentence with except for time, motive, opportunity, you know, fancy uniforms, etc., etc., etc. If, if, if what you wanted to say was that we have the same sin nature in us, and but for the grace of God, I, you know, if, if that's what you want to say, great. You should make that clear, first of all, <laughs> because then you're going to minimize everything I just said. Okay, that's important. But we come to this. The universality of sin's presence proves this point, that there is a unity in the sinfulness of sin. The fact that it is everywhere, and we've already proven that in that section on sin. It's part of what we mean by total depravity. It's the totality of the human race. There is none who does good, not even one, Paul says in Romans 3. So it just follows from what we saw last time about the universality of sin. If all men sin every day, then those same all men should expect something of a universal consequence. If they're all under the law, Romans 3, 19 and 20, the law speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, that the whole human race would be held accountable to God and so forth, well, they should expect that there's going to be at least some kind of universal consequence. Lamentations 3.39 says, why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? And of course, our pride rises up and says, because I'm not as bad as that guy, because of my circumstances, etc. Uh, Matthew 25.41 is a, is a clear passage for this where Jesus says about the final judgment, He says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So notice that Jesus singles out a group of people and that whole group of people that are simply called those on his left. But who's on his left? It's every single sinner that has not put their trust in Jesus Christ. So these words of Jesus plainly teach that all of the wicked will receive at least the same main punishment, that of eternal damnation. Not addressing specific, we looked at Romans 2, 5 as one clue that there could be diversity of wrath poured out, diversity of intensity and so forth, because of the diversity of sin and its guilt. But then it is also true that all of the wicked will receive at least the same main punishment. Their destiny will be eternal damnation. This is also proven from the unity of sin's nature. It's infinitely evil in all cases. And that's really what this picture starts to point to, is that, and we'll we'll look at a verse especially, James 2.10 is the verse I like to start with on this, about why is the guilt of the slightest sin, in one sense, the same as the guilt of, I'm going to have in my mind, some great sin, what Hitler did. It, it'll definitely be somebody other than me. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to shift the blame out there, and I'm going to say I have someone else in my mind versus the slightest sin I commit. Why? What is it about the slightest sin? And as we look at the Ten Commandments and all the various ways, or like the young ruler, all these things I have done. So, my Jesus says one thing. There's one thing that makes all these things what they are. Why do you call me good? Good teacher, good boy, good test, good thing, good job. I've done a good job. What makes those words good or all these things? What makes that mean anything? What makes a sin a sin? What makes the guilt the guilt? It's something about God. There's something behind the commandments, and I'll just read the verse, uh, James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, I, one, one reaction to this verse is just, just to stop right there and to say, well, that's hyperbole. Really? I mean, I know he wants to say something true, but surely he doesn't mean that if you fail in one point of it, but you keep everything else you're guilty of all of it. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, obviously James doesn't mean if you have, um, to go back to Matthew 5, if you've coveted against uh, your neighbor's wife, therefore you 
are the person that committed murder. Now, obviously, James doesn't mean that. Well, you shoplifted, so you must have been, you must have been the person to, to murder the person in the store. Well, no, James doesn't mean that. So what does he mean by you're guilty of the whole? Well, he gives you his reason. He says, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. He doesn't confuse things. He just says you've become a transgressor of the law. Uh, I always tell people that one of the most important neglected word in the entire English Bible a lot of people's problem is not that they don't know Greek. A lot of people's problem is that they don't know English. And I'm speaking to English speakers. I'm not talking about people who don't know English. Because uh, uh, modern Americans, I would dare say, don't know a whole lot of their own language. One of the most neglected words in the entire Bible is the word for. What's it? Like, therefore, what's it there for? But, but what does it even mean? It means because. I know we don't talk like that anymore. And I think even Bible translations need to take that into account. We don't even use those regular conjunctions in the way that people used them 50 or 60 years ago. So you just gloss over it. It means because. So what's James doing? He's giving you a cause or a reason or a logical grounding. He's answering your question. Why is it that whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point becomes guilty of all of it? Because, or for this reason, he, God, who said this command, the, the same God who commanded this command commanded this command. So what's James, what's he talking about? He's not, he's not saying that murder and adultery are the same thing in every respect. He's telling you that there is a person behind the commandments. And really, there's a person behind life and marriage that make life and marriage images of God. And you've trampled on that, which is to say that you've lied about God in a most violent manner in this case. But behind the law, behind the commandments, is an infinite good, and that's why it is just and right that you spend eternity in hell. That's what James is saying. Because you covered the glory of God from your own soul and from the souls of everyone that you know, when people observed your life, they said and agreed with you, you're right, God is not that glorious. When in fact their soul was made to live on Him, you've just murdered them. You've just starved their soul of everything that they need. That's what James is saying. In breaking the least, it was just a little, it was just a little covering up of God's glory. So uh, that's what James is saying, and that's why the, the least sin in that sense is... And Thomas Watson kind of uh, turns that on its head. He gives you another reason, but just the other side of the same coin. He, he basically says... I don't remember how he says it, but it was in the Doctrine of Repentance, I think, where he said that um, the, the reason the least sin is actually a worse sin is because you were willing to trade the glory of Christ for what? So, so pick, a, pick a little sin, for a little white lie, you know, whatever it is. You're willing to trade in the glory of God. You're willing to trade in other people seeing the worth of Christ and how you live your life because you wanted a, yeah, I don't know, whatever it is whatever the least sin is. So he kind of flips the coin and, and, and uses that same logic to show why the, like the, why the least sin is actually, in another sense, the more aggravating sin. So um, there's all sorts of reasons why this is the case. Now, as to the Scriptures, besides G, uh, James 2.10, um, oh, I've got some more down there. Sorry. I, I will get to these ones. I will get to these ones. Some other uh, points on this. Um, Dabney wrote this. He says, Note that God's perfections, like those ones up there, God's perfections necessitate that He shall be the righteous enemy and punisher of transgression. So, um, you know, we start getting into questions like, well, would a good God sentence people to hell? And what kind of a, a God would do such and such? And, um, and the answer is a good God. Because on the flip side of that when you're talking about justice is what kind of a judge? You know, there's Proverbs 17, 15 gives us that dilemma that um, he who justifies or exonerates really in um, the righteous and he who condemns the, the innocent are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So what kind of a judge sentences people to everlasting or infinite punishment 
given the nature of the sin, is, the answer is a good and righteous judge. That's what a, a good and righteous judge would do. So when we say that all sin from the least evil, when we say it's the least evil, looks evil, least evil to us, to the most evil, deserves the wrath and curse of God, this demands that there is something in the least sin that is of the same kind as the supposedly greatest sin. So uh, W.G.T. Shedd uh, puts it in this way. He says, Sins of thoughtlessness are truly sinful as deliberate sins. Men generally are not self-conscious of the secret sins, and he quotes Psalm 19.12, and we'll look at this other one, Psalm 98, in a little bit. Not generally self-conscious of secret sins, of feeling and desire which they are committing inwardly all the time. The purpose of preaching the law is to produce the self-consciousness of sin, the darkness in which, according to St. Paul in Ephesians 4.18 Men walk is the thoughtless unconsciousness in which they live and act. We're going to look now at another argument for this, a category in the Bible uh, called unintentional sin. And one of the verses that Shed quoted from was Psalm 19.12, where David actually prays for God to, to keep him from not only presumptuous sins, but hidden faults. David has these two categories of sins that are presumptuous sins, that I, I, they're flagrant sins. I know that what I'm doing is wrong, and I'm doing it anyway. But then he says hidden faults. And our problem is that's, that's a repugnant category to us. How can a sin be a sin if I don't know that it's a sin? And, and there's two potential answers for that besides, well, it's in the Bible, and I'm about to read you the verses in a second. But in addition to that, there is a suppression that Paul talks about in Ephesians 1, sorry, in Romans 1.18, where deep down we do know, but we've sort of shoved it to the periphery, we've suppressed it, etc. We have a memory of it, or we may know the principle is wrong, but we've failed to apply it. And the second answer kind of goes along with that, that we've failed in some way. There are some things that if you don't know, will get you killed. Going back to Nadab and Abihu, you're like, wait a minute, I don't see a manual anywhere here in Leviticus that tells them you're not to offer the strange fire. In fact, I don't even know what the strange fire is. It doesn't tell me in the text. And I want to know. Well, here's your problem. Nadab and Abihu apparently did not want to know. They didn't care. There's some things that if you don't know, will get you killed. And if you know that, and you should, you ought to have found out. You ought to have said, is there a cliff here? Can this person that I'm charged to take care of get hurt because of this thing? If you don't care about that, you're morally blameworthy for not discovering more of the truth. And so when the Bible talks about these unintentional sins, these are not in the category of, where'd that come from? You can start to trace out in the law, oh, that's where that came from. They were a priest of God. That makes, makes total sense. Leviticus 5, 17, 18, if anyone sins, doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandment, ought not to be done. And see, he says, by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not do it. Let me repeat that again until the pennies drop. They didn't know what? Where was this written? Doing any of the things that by the, co- the Lord's commandment ought not to be done. It was written. It was spoken. Now, how did they come not to know it? It's like Josiah, when he discovers the law, or at least that part of Deuteronomy, in Kings, when the priest brings the law in and he tears his robe, and what does he do? He repents on behalf of the people for sinning in all these different ways. Well, how they sin? Well, there's this part of the law they didn't, their fathers neglected. They just discovered it again. You say, well, well, they didn't know. Well, the fathers knew, and they're morally blameworthy. Okay, so it says that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally, and he shall be forgiven. There's another example of that of the priests, and particularly one named Uzzah in Samuel. It reaches out to steady the ark when David's bringing the ark into Jerusalem. And David's even like, what? What I thought what we're doing is pleasing to you. And he realizes the law. Well, he's not a priest. He's a king. And there's a way to handle the ark and all his different things. And, and if they didn't care for that, then that, that's a problem. 
Psalm 90, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. So the idea of our secret sins in the light of God's presence, that's how God has set our iniquities before Him. And, and fundamentally, our iniquities are before Him, as David says, against you, you only have I sinned. The Westminster Divines drew from Paul's words in Ephesians 5, which can well make both of our points today in Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So to our first point, the, the plurality of these things, the diversity of these things, calls attention to the, actually this is more the second point, the commonality of such sins. They're, they're all equally going to be punished. And that's what Paul's warning. All these different sins that he had listed, the wrath of God falls on all of them. So they're, they're all sinful. But the fact that you can be deceived about this, and by different degrees, recalls everything about our first point. Uh, likewise, Luke 12, 48, which the Westminster Divines put with the second question, and I think it makes both points, where Jesus says, but the one who did not know and and did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. So there's to our first point. Someone's receiving a lighter beating than someone else. The one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. He says, and then he gives us the principle. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much was required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. So to close out this second point about the universality of guilt, Dabney gives a summary and he puts it under six heads. In other words, uh, six reasons why all sins are worthy of the curse and wrath of God. So Dabney says this, but affirmatively, the ill desert of sin is infinite because of, this is the first reason, because of the excellence, universality, and practical value of the law broken by it. In other words, because the law is as glorious as it is, therefore violating any part of it is guilty of an infinite crime. Secondly, because of the natural mischievousness of sin to the sinner himself, right? It's murder of the soul. Third, because of the majesty and perfection of the lawgiver assailed by the transgression. It's James 2.10. Fourth, because sin is committed against mercies and blessings so great. Fifth, because it violates so perfect a title to our services, that of creation out of nothing. I think I know what he means there, but uh, that's a very uh, strange way to our ears of, of saying it. I'm going to get into a whole discussion there. And last, because it's so continually multiplied by transgressions. Again, uh, each sin multiplies other sins. So in closing, let's talk about practical application of this. And I have three here of this. And when I say this uses of this doctrine, I mean putting the two together of both questions. Namely that some sins are greater sins than others and have greater guilt than others. And all sins equally deserve the curse and wrath of God. Put these two things together, and it prevents you from two extreme kinds of arrogance. And that's why I think they're back-to-back. -back. These are two ditches that people can fall into, because you see what's wrong with the other, so you just, well, I go to the other extreme. So if on the one hand, if I think of my sin as somehow more excusable in the sight of God than those of my neighbors, right? I say, well, I'm better than that guy. Well, I haven't done that and so on, then I'm well on my way to expanding my sin and never repenting of it, right? I'm, I'm taking a low view of my sin. I'm doing that by way of comparison. In other words, I'm hardening my heart in the very process of thinking that thought. I've neglected the sense in which all have fallen short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. And so if I do that, well, then I'm not desperate to hear more of the gospel, right? I'm making these comparisons. And I think that's what, like, the, the new Calvinists are good at sniffing out. We want, we want, we're the people that say, well, I'm not, uh, I, I, I am, I am as bad as Hitler, but for the grace of God. We're all sinners. That's true, that's important, and that's foundational to the gospel, right? 
But I can mean that in a way that swings the pendulum to the other extreme. If I go the other way and I think of all sin as the same in every which way, then I will tend to take a light view of arresting the development of sin. Or I'll have a light view of sin out there around me. I don't want to make comparisons. Well, there for the grace of God go I. I don't want to judge. And I go to that extreme. I can't condemn gross evil out in the world. It's not a gospel issue. We're all sinners after all. Terrible counselor if you do that. Don't be a counselor if you do that. Don't do conflict resolution. Now, now, we're all sinners. Pat, pat, pat. You go back to that place of what? Nothing, because we're all sinners, and it's just the little sin monster in all of us, and no big deal. Who are any of us to judge? Who among us is without sin? And so at one extreme, I excuse sin in my heart, because it's not as bad as someone else's. On the other, I excuse sin around me, which of course now is just another sin in my, ha- in my heart, because that's a sin to do that. So this doctrine helps us see what is wrong with all sin and that that is perfectly consistent with saying that there is an aggravation of sin. Secondly, on both points, to study the sinfulness of sin is the business of Christians that actually desire to stop sinning. If you want to stop sinning, if you know sinning is bad, if you want to honor Christ, then you should make use of this doctrine. What's the first rule of war? besides knowing you're in a war. Sometimes I think that should be the first rule of war to people today. But the, but the first rule of war to people back in the day that actually knew there were such things going on in the world is know your enemy. And if you're going to know your enemy, you should know that your enemy, your first enemy, is, is within. Our enemy here is as evil as it is precisely because of how it wars against the glory of God, the honor of our king. There's that, the, the, the picture back there of that. What makes this so bad? I want to know what makes the enemy within me so evil, so I'll actually start to hate it and not simply talk about it. We we can't see the depth of sin's evil if we never develop a sense of God's holiness or care whether or not things tend to make God seem glorious. But if you know the real guilt of sin more and to agree more and more with the justice of the sentence against sin, and you will come to treat sin more like the enemy that it actually is. And then finally, if that point is true, then a growing appreciation of the law will follow from that, and a growing use of the law, not just for preachers, for parents, in your evangelism. If the law does this, if the law shows the sinfulness of sin, in all of these different ways. Or conversely, if I, if I blunt any of the edges of, of that, if I don't take sin seriously. In other words, if, if I can't say to someone like Ray Comfort does, the way of the master, kind of a, an approach, that, uh, you know, have you ever lusted after a woman in your heart? You're in this crowd, and, and somebody says, well, no. And, and okay, yeah. So, well, now you're, have you ever lied? <laughs> and they say, uh, no. Well, well, now you're a liar, and uh, you know how he does it. He, he, he says that sort of thing. And that follows from the idea that every single sin is justly under the condemnation of God. But on the other hand, if you you hold on to that and you don't understand that there's also an aggravation of sin, then then how are you going to meet people with the law in the precise ways that they're sinning? You know, when you say things like, that's not a gospel issue, abortion or um, sexual deviancy of some sort, that's not a gospel issue. But aren't those just more ways of sinning? that they need to repent of and that the gospel solves that problem and all that stuff. Uh, So how do you preach the gospel to people who 90% of what they actually want to get away with are all those things that the Christians are retreating and retreating and treating from speaking about? Well, then how do you bring the law to bear in those very things? And so to review Paul's words to close in Romans 7, 7, "If if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So if we're going to be about the gospel, then we we have to be about the law as well. So I'll close there and open it up to questions or comments.
Yep. This might be outside the scope. But so, you know, what is the proper way to deal with when you see sin? Obviously, in yourself, it's to repent mm -hmm. and to turn yeah. when you see sin in your own heart. Right. But what if you see others committing sin? A good first step is to discern, is this a professing Christian or not? And then to take it to a next level, if they are a professing Christian, what is their view of God's Word? Because a lot of people profess to be Christians, but they mean nothing by the authority of God's Word and so forth. So you flesh those things out, and now you're ready for the dare. If they say, yes, I believe every word of, of the Bible, well, great. Well, the Bible says this about the law and sin, whatever the particular sin is. Now, they may flutter there and say, that's Old Testament, not New Testament, or that's Paul, not Jesus. They may try one of those things. And there you'll have to pin them down, and it's inevitably, you've got to do some theology with that person. But they're professing to be a Christian. Now, all of this, of course, is assuming it's not a hostile work environment and you're going to get in trouble because you have to walk through those issues as well. But if you have their ear, I would say just walking them through those three steps. And once you get them there, just to ultimately what I'm saying is to call them to repentance. But there are obstacles in the way uh, of those kind that you have to flesh out to say, is this person even hearing me or are they old versus new or all that kind of stuff? Yeah. But then what about you know, the sin in general? Mm -hmm. Well, if they're not a professing Christian. Yeah. If they're not a professing Christian, then we have to say, okay, what are the uses of the law here? The third one has to wait on the, sorry, the first, yeah, well, the third one too. The third use of the law, the directive use, they're not Christians, so that's out. The first use of the law, the evangelical use, I have to rely on the Holy Spirit to do that. Maybe I'll keep working on that, and I'll keep working on this person preaching the gospel. But now what do, I'm going to apply the second use of the law, the civil use. And depending on what the sin is, you now realize that there is a, well, I guess, uh, give me an example so I can maybe... Uh, oh, let's take sexual deviation. Yeah. Okay, the person says, well, that's none of your business, as long as two people love each other and so forth and so on. Now, depending, if the, if the conversation has already gotten to political things, then you can use the second use of the law to talk about the role of the civil magistrate in the government. You have to make the case why this is a public issue. And that's a huge conversation and so on. Now, on the other hand, if you're talking about just them personally in their lives and exercising that, you know, the workplace and stuff like that, you'll have to make some of the same arguments. You know, as a business owner, I have the, the right with these to, to use my business the way that it, it should be. And you can make moral arguments for that as a matter of honesty. You know, you, we're, you're voluntarily uh, exchanging your labor for my, a bit of my income. And in doing that, we're being honest with each other. And I said at the beginning that, that these sort of things weren't allowed uh, and so forth. It, so some of it depends on what exactly they're doing with it. If they're proselytizing for that, you have leverage there. Um, so yeah, but ultimately it falls into that category, the second use of the law. Yeah. Any buzzer beaters? I'm finishing a little bit earlier this time, so got the bigger. Mm -hmm. If their concept of who God is doesn't cover his authority to say what sin is, yeah. then you're not going to get anywhere. Right, right. Um, and, and there is a, there's the person that's not a professing Christian, there's a person who is a professing Christian, and there's all these, there's sort of this gooey area today of like, oh, I'm spiritual. And, and then you can really narrow things down with a question like, well, who do you think God is? And, and, may, and they may respond by saying something that you could just hear on Oprah. And, and then you really got to change tactic. Well, my God is not like that. Yeah. My God would never, my God is loving. He would accept everyone and so on. And you could talk about, well, is it loving? You can use slippery slope arguments. Like, is, is this loving with these effects? And is this God's design? And if this is love, where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? What about this kind of relationship? And so forth. And if they say, and I know this is not an ethics class or an apologetics class, but I'll throw this in there. And if they say, well, that's different, supposing you bring up 20 years ago pedophilia or something like that, whereas now um, they, they may not blink an eye at that and they may try to justify it. But anyway, but you, you be pedophilia or something else against consent or whatever else. And if they say, that's different, then you have a golden opportunity to go in there and say, wait a minute, I thought we weren't bringing morality into this. What makes it different? Because it's certainly not biology. It's certainly not circumstance. There they are doing it. It apparently is in their nature to do it. 
So don't ever get turned back by this, well, it's in their nature, and it's genetics, and don't you know the study, which is bogus anyway. But let's say they go there. Um, we need to sharpen our arguments there and change our arguments there and realize that that's actually not an argument there. That actually plays into our hands. Me being a pickpocket is natural. Me being a drunkard is natural. So in my nature, here I am doing it. Where'd that come from? If you believe nature is all there is, then everything's natural. So you haven't made any distinction. The moment you say that's different, you're bringing morality back into this. And what's your source of morality? We have one. You don't. Um, so you can, really, you can really corner people with that kind of genetics or nature argument. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, all right. Well, I will, I'll end it at that. I'll pray. Father, we thank you for this time and looking at your law and how it exposes even our sin, how every sin is an offense to you. Lord, help that to humble our hearts that we would be desperate for your solution in the gospel and your power of the Holy Spirit and the clarity of your word and how it tells us the good news. So let that be the case for us as we participate in all the means of grace today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.